Hi, I'm Lena Rao. Welcome to our Ask a VC show where we put VCs in the hot seat. Today we're joined by Glenn Solomon, partner at GGV Capital. Glenn, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Lena. Uh, just want to go into your bio. Uh, you joined GGV as a partner in 2006, and you focus on investments in enterprise software as a service, cloud infrastructure, and mobile companies. You've led GGV's investments in Pandora, Success Factors, which went public and then was acquired by SAP, um, Isilon, Quinn Street, the recently public Nimble Storage, which went IPO'd last week, Square, Conviva, Domo, Grid Store, Zendesk. Oh my gosh, the list goes on. My gosh, do you have time for a personal life? You have so many great investments in there. Um, you know, you've done a, a lot of these great investments and that have gone public, have been acquired. But one of the things that I know that you've been particularly active in is investing in China. And, and um, I should note, GGV does sort of Series C, Series B, and late stage. Is that correct? Yeah, the predominance of our capital at GGV has been invested in Series B and C rounds. That's that's where we focus. Okay, and uh, you focus on U.S. and China as well. Tell me about what's happening in China. It's a it's a big question, um, but how you know what are sort of the companies that are coming out of there, and how how does success look there? Yeah. So you're right. At GGV, we invest in China and the U.S., and we've been doing that since our inception in 2000. So we were early to the market in China, and China's evolved a lot uh, during that time. Uh, I go there a lot. I've been there 32 times in the last uh, eight years, wow. the eight years I've been at GGV, so, and I've, I've seen change. That's a lot of miles. It's mm -hmm. a lot of miles. Um, and my partners in China also come to the U.S. a lot, and uh, one of the ways we try to differentiate our business, and we saw this trend happening a couple of years ago, but it's starting to accelerate, is that China and the U.S. are by far the two largest economies on the world scale. And as technology goes, they're by far the two largest. Uh, and they're increasingly intertwining. And so for entrepreneurs who are thinking about being global, and increasingly we're seeing entrepreneurs in the U.S. and in China who want to be global, the, the other market, either China or U.S., is the next market to go to. We're seeing more and more entrepreneurs thinking that way. And so that's one of the big changes. Uh, and that plays in our hand because our business is uh, very much integrated in that, in that way between China and the U.S. Another thing I'd say about China is it's a, it's a, um, a market where uh, several years ago, U.S. VCs thought the way to play it was, hey, we'll just create the blank of China and we'll invest in a company that kind of looks like one that was successful here in China and it will work. Well, it turns out that China is a very unique market. Yeah. Uh, and so while some of the needs are similar to needs here in the U.S., the way you implement those needs and start companies and grow companies has to be very local. Could you give me an example of that? Yeah. So uh, GGV was an, an early investor in Alibaba. Um, and I can remember... Uh, six, seven years ago, talking to a friend uh, who's now in the VC industry, who shall go nameless, who at the time was an exec at eBay, who told me, oh, you're, you're in Alibaba, we're going to kill Alibaba because here at eBay we just went into China. Uh, and we're going to build our business and we know Alibaba has this, this thing called Taobao over there, but it, we're going to kill it. Well, looking at it today, uh, six, seven years later, uh, Taobao and Tmall, Alibaba's e-commerce businesses, are the largest in the world today, larger than Amazon, uh, larger than eBay, probably Amazon and eBay combined at this point in terms of GMV. Um, and that's because uh, they took what was a, 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 an eBay-type model and morphed it for China, made it unique to the China market, and made it really work well in China, whereas eBay tried to uh, you know, just use their US model, and it, it didn't quite adapt as well. Yeah, so what are the components um, of you know, catering to that market and really paying attention to the needs of the users there. Is it like going mobile first? Is it, you know, a certain design element? Good, good question. So mobile is, is um, I would say, as big as it he is here in the U.S., it's e even bigger in China. Uh, and if you look at the data now, you'll see that in China there's actually more uh, mobile devices that are active, smart mobile devices that are active on a monthly basis than there are in the U.S., so it's, it's truly a bigger market. But there are unique elements to the market there. For example, the advertising business is not as well developed in China. At the flip side, uh, virtual item revenue and virtual goods and, and, and um, uh, micropayments are more accepted, more uh, um, mature in China. And so uh, we're invested in a company, for example, called YY, 
which uh, similar and another company uh, that's done extremely well in China is Tencent. These are companies that make most of their revenue not from advertising. They they make some revenue from advertising, but the lion's share of the revenue is actually coming from virtual item revenue, from yeah. users paying for various um, subscriptions, for status, for um, goods and services in game, virtual items, yeah. that kind of thing. That's a really interesting point. I mean, that's not something virtual goods isn't quite the massive uh, business here as it is over in China, but clearly there's some opportunity there. When you think about marketplaces, I mean, there's a lot of great marketplaces in China that are doing very, very well. What's the thing about marketplaces that, that really, why is it in China that marketplaces are succeeding so well? It's taking off here definitely a little bit more of late, mm -hmm. but what has made it such a booming business across all these different sectors in China? Well, for, first, going back to the point about mobile, you have in China consumers uh, um, who have, have been exposed to the internet mobile first. So they think about accessing information and accessing markets, buying products with a mobile phone or a tablet in hand. That's how they have learned to consume. So the impulse there is, is much more ingrained in society than it is here. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why if you're an entrepreneur and you start a business where you can sell online in one way or another, you're going to get a good reception in China. Uh, also, in China, the, the alternatives are sometimes less well-developed in certain markets. So, um, you know, here we had a, uh, a, a flourishing market for um, hotels. Right. Airbnb comes around and they've done very well. Uh, we're invested in a company in China called Tujia, which is looking to do something similar. And we're seeing a lot of momentum in that market because although the hotel business is starting to, to, to grow up in China, it's not, it's not a business that's been around for 100 years the way it has here right. in the US. Right. So the alternatives, people are more willing to try. That's a very interesting point. Well, I want to switch gears a little bit to IPOs and, and sort of the market um, both this year and, and potentially for next year. You know, you've obviously led a number of very successful IPOs over the past few years and, and certainly one that, that just IPO'd last week. Um, what are sort of you seeing in the IPO market or what have you seen this year that either will carry on or change mm -hmm. next year? So, um, you know, IPOs like any other marketplace are a function of supply and demand. Um, in the case of the IPO market, the demand comes from institutional investors who are looking to invest capital in places they think they can get growth and uh, make money. The supply side are companies that are private that could be interesting uh, to fit in that equation. And um, over the last several years, the IPO market has been what I'd call decent, but certainly not uh, fantastic in the way that it was fantastic in the years leading up to the internet bubble, let's say. Um, this has been, the second half of this year has been stronger, and I think one of the reasons that's the case is we've had lots of very good private companies who've right. been able to stay private longer because there's plenty of capital now available to private companies to continue to grow before they go public, right. on the one hand. And on the other side, uh, the themes around cloud computing and mobile are really making it very difficult for incumbent technology companies to produce any kind of growth at all. So public investors are left looking for growth outside of the traditional places they founded, like Oracle, SAP, right. uh, IBM, Microsoft. And they're now looking um, at a lot, looking at companies that are private that are coming public. Yeah. And so you saw companies like Splunk, um, like Tableau Software, like Workday, like ServiceNow, like Nimble Storage, where we were involved coming public and getting very good reception because their their growth profile is very different than what the public investor can see uh, in, in public companies. Yeah, I mean, and those all those companies are, are enterprise. Um, and, and, you know, you certainly have a pretty extensive experience in investing in the enterprise. Are we going to see that success in the IPO market carry on to 2014? I mean, certainly the I would say the best IPO, performing IPOs of the past year or two have been in enterprise. Uh, is that happening in 2014? Yeah, so uh, 2014, I expect to be pretty much a continuation of what we've seen in the second half of 13, which is mm -hmm. high quality private companies um, coming to the market looking very unique, 
with a very receptive uh, institutional investor audience looking to invest in those companies. And you mentioned enterprise. We've got companies uh, out there like, you know, Box, who you've talked yeah. a lot about, and uh, and Dropbox, and right. uh, other interesting companies yeah. like that that I think will will do quite well when they go public. There's also consumer-oriented businesses um, that I think will also do well. The Airbnbs, the Pinterests of the world, when they're ready to go public. I think another trend you're going to see more and more of is the big Chinese internet companies, to go back to our China theme, the Tencents, the Alibabas, the Baidus, uh, the Chihus, the Xiaomi's coming to the U.S. and investing lots of capital. Yeah. They're competing ferociously with each other now, and the U.S. is the next frontier for them. They're, they're dominating the China market. U.S. comes next. That's only going to add interest among public investors in the U.S. because they're going to see one more potential strategic buying source out there right. being the Chinese internet companies. Well, these are some great predictions for 2014. We're going to hold you to that and check in with you next year. Sounds like a plan. Thanks so much, Glenn. Thanks, Lena.